Okay, guys, so let me just uh, tell you that this will this video will be explaining the second Wilford theorem. In the previous video, we saw the first Wilford theorem. Let me just recall you that the first Wilford theorem states if x and p are part of a Baldrashian equilibrium, then x is better efficient, right? So we just saw this with the edge red box, for example, that the outcome, the final allocation, was going to be in the counter curve. So it's going to be Pareto efficient, okay? But we also said that the opposite was not true, that if I have an allocation that it's Pareto efficient, not necessarily will be a Valrashian equilibrium, and that is what the second welfare theorem is about. Okay, so this is our second welfare theorem. As you can see, it's quite longer than the first one. Yes, and first we are going to suppose that we're going to assume that x is Pareto efficient, okay? We are going to assume some things more. One of them is that all agents have a positive initial dotation of the goods. Yes, so uh, everyone has something about each good. And preferences are going to be convex, continuous, and monotone. In such case, there will exist a case, there will be exist some prices, such that X can be of a rational equilibrium for such initial dotation. Okay, so uh, what we are saying is, if X is but a deficient, I must add positive initial dotations I must uh, add continuous, convex, and monotone preferences, and then I will be able to find some prices such that that x I was talking about is part of a Valrashian equilibrium. So think about the following. Suppose that I have an economy, I have two agents, so I can represent them in the edge earth box. I have agent A and I have agent B, yes, and I have some preferences where um, I have Cobb Douglas for both of them. Okay, so easy dizzy, you already know how to do this. So you have these things over here, okay? Now let us assume that this point over here is the initial dotation, okay, I will draw the contract curve, yes, so now this point over here, this point is inside the contract curve, right, so I will say that I will tag this point as x, so this x is better efficient, but in this economy, this x is not of a rational equilibrium. Yes? Uh, the question is, can I move something such that this x can be part of a rational equilibrium? The theorem states that I need two things. I need positive initial dotations, right? And I also need that my preferences are continuous, convex, and monotone. I accomplished this in this scenario because I have Cup Douglas and we know that they all accomplished this. Yes. However, this initial dotation, it's not enough to have this X as of a rational equilibrium. Remember that the budget constraint, so the prices, must cross through W. Yes, and at the end of the day, the marginal rate of substitution of A must be equal to the marginal rate of substitution of B and those must be equal to the relative prices. Yes. So if I take this W as given, there will be no prices that accomplish these conditions in order to have X as the solution of the problem or the Valrashian equilibrium. But what if instead of this W, I have as an initial dotation this W prime? 
Under this W prime, I will be able to find some prices such that I have X prime as my final solution as part of the vibration equilibrium. Yes, so what does that mean? That means that I, as an authority, can have an initial reallocation of the goods to have a different outcome that I could have in free market. And this has a lot of implications in public policy. Why are there a lot of implications in public policy for the second welfare theorem? Suppose that we have this scenario. Yes, so this W indicates the initial allocation. As you can see, agent A is quite poor. I mean, versus B, he has almost nothing. Yes? The Valrashian equilibrium I will expect is going to be efficient by the first welfare theorem, and it's going to be in the trading zone. So maybe this X will be the final location. Okay? So suppose that you're a benevolent government, yes, and you know that agent A is quite poor and that if you let the free market to run just like that, you will have an allocation which will continue, so to speak, to have an agent A which is poor, yes? And you would like to have a better outcome. For example, you would rather like to have this other point, X prime, as the final allocation for this economy. In this X prime, you are sure that A is not that bad, even though B still has most of the cake, yes? So what would you do? You can make transfers, initial transfers, yes, of welfare. So what if I tax agent B and what I have from the tax of agent A, B, I transfer it to agent A. That means that for agent B, I will decrease his welfare before the market works, and I will increase the welfare of A. So suppose that I make some transfer, so I take some elements of good one and good two from B, and I give them to A. Yes, and I say that I will start with this W prime as the initial dotation for the market. Yeah, so I can do this by transfers, meaning some taxes, for example. Yeah, so I took some elements of for B and I gave them back to A. Now, in this scenario, I can have X prime as a solution of the Valrhesian equilibrium. Now I let the market work and I will find some prices such that X prime is the final outcome of this free market. Right? Yes. So that is why it has a lot of implications in policy. However, however we said that for this theorem to work, the preferences must be continuous, convex, and monotone, right? Otherwise, they would not work. So suppose that I have x1 here, I have x2 over here, so these are my preferences. Clearly, I have a problem of convexity over here, right? Well, suppose that these are preferences of agent B. And then I have the preferences of agent A in such a way that he has Cobb Douglas. Yes. So he has this, he has this, and he has this, and he has that. Right? So if I have this type of preferences, yes, what happens if I have over here W, so this is W, yes, and I have these prices over here that tend to be the prices of the Valrhesian equilibrium. For agent A, things are going to be easy. Agent A will demand this, right? He is maximizing his utility subject to his budget constraint. But the problem with, B, with agent B, which doesn't have this 
monotonicity and convexity properties of his preferences. He will, for example, in this case, he will maximize his utility in three different points, here, here, and over here, right? As I have multiplicity of solutions, what if agent B ends up demanding this amount of goods? Will this be of a rational equilibrium? Yes or no? Well, at the moment, you should know now what will happen. Agent A is demanding this amount of good, 1, right? Agent A, as well, is demanding this amount of good, of good, 2. What is demanding agent B? Of good 1, he is demanding this amount, x1 for B, right? So he is demanding this. And for good 2, he is demanding this amount, x2 of b. Yes? Look at market num of good 2. x2a plus x2b is exceeding what? The sum of the demands of good 2. So x2a plus x2b, as you can see, it's far larger than the total amount of good 2 I have. Hence, this cannot be a Valvation equilibrium. Yes, that is why I am saying that for the second welfare theorem, I need these properties of the preferences. Yes, remember, this point can be efficient, yes, but if I don't have the properties, the correct properties of my preferences, so if properties are not continuous, convex, and monotone, maybe this point, which was already a Valrassian, uh, but at efficient allocation, will not be part of a Valrassian equilibrium. Yes, so I need this properties for my preferences. Okay guys, so I'll stop here. In the next slide you have the proof of it. So this is the proof of the second welfare theorem, yes. X will be pareto efficient, of course, yes. As it is pareto efficient, it has to be visible. That means that uh, the amount of the of x cannot exceed the supply. Yes. Uh, by the Valras law, there must exist a price that uh, clears the market and that allocation. Yes. And this allocation that it's a Valrassian equilibrium, we should prove that it's exactly the same as the x, which is better to efficient. Okay. So. Um, it's not that difficult. Uh, it's true because of feasibility. Feasibility is one point. If I don't select one X, then it gave me a higher utility. Then why wouldn't I select it X? Yes. And I will always prefer the one that gives me more by monotonicity. So I will stop here. And if you have any doubt, just ask. Bye-bye.